Did you play with Legos when you were a kid? I, I did. And when, when, uh, when we were kids, Legos came in a bucket. When you opened up the bucket, you poured the Legos out on the floor. There were no instructions. It didn't tell you what to do with them. You just built whatever you wanted to build. But today, they're a little different. Today, they come like this. This is an Imperial dropship with four stormtroopers in it. It's a Lego kit. And the, the goal of this kit is to create an Imperial dropship. If you create a pterodactyl, people are going to look at you funny, like, there's something wrong with that kid. He didn't build an Imperial dropship. Now, the experience of doing this, if you've ever helped your kids build one of these, is that typically the kid gets bored because the instructions are so finite. You have to follow the instructions in order to build the thing, and you end up building it while your kid plays with something else, and then when you're done, they, uh, you know, play with the thing that you built. So the kid's experience is to go through the numbers, or your experience is to simply paint by the numbers. Now that's not to say that there's not a tremendous amount of critical and creative thinking that goes into this kit, into building this kit. The only problem is that all of that critical and creative thinking is happening at a desk in Billund, Denmark at LEGO headquarters, where there are numerous jobs for LEGO designers. Those people are thinking like crazy. They're building all kinds of cool things, and they're thinking in order to do it. It doesn't happen, however, on the kid's desk. The thinking is not happening. In fact, I use this as a metaphor for what my concern is with what we're doing as educators. Out of the goodness of our hearts, and, and, and with really good intentions, I think that as curriculum designers and teachers the night before class and lesson planners and all that kind of stuff, we are surgically removing the thinking from the curriculum. What I mean by that is we're, 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 we're organizing the knowledge so much for the kids and not letting them know about it that the thinking has com been completely removed from the equation. That we just give them these sort of curricular kits and the thinking never has to happen on their desk. So what we need to do is get the thinking back in the equation. It cannot end up being K equals I. It has to be K equals I times T. Knowledge is equal to information times thinking. This is a, a universal theory of education, a universal theory that guides everything that we do in education. So when we go around the country and, and around the world and talk about getting the thinking back in education, we very rarely, in fact, I've never run into an educator who looked me in the eye and said, I don't think thinking's important. I've never found that educator. Typically, the educational response from superintendents and principals and teachers is, okay, thinking's really important. Let's do a critical thinking course sophomore year in high school. And of course, we know that's not gonna work for a couple reasons. One is, it's you know too small, it's a Band-Aid. Um, two is, uh, thinking is the thing that should be structuring information along the entire continuum of education. Every standard, every, all of the curriculum should be structured by thinking all the way along. So it should be in parallel. The other idea that we hear a lot is, is simply um, that if we, because thinking is so important and because it's so sort of intangible, we don't know how to do it, what we'll do is we'll increase the bandwidth. It's a bandwidth solution. So we'll just cram more information into these kids. We'll create more AP classes, advanced placement classes in high school. We'll get more rigor and more relevance and we'll, we'll cram more information down the pipe. And by some miracle, the kids will end up thinking. And it reminds me of one of my favorite cartoons, which is that this, these, these scientists figuring out this problem and then they say, you know, and then a miracle occurs and uh, they get to where where they're trying to get to. But there's this big gap in the, in the thinking. And it reminds me of that, that we are waiting for a miracle to happen where these kids are gonna somehow end up being able to think. The miracle isn't happening. These kids are getting to their first year in college and second year in college and their first year in grad school and second year in grad school. They're getting to their first jobs in life and they don't know how to think. The miracle is not happening. We don't need a miracle. What we need is a method. Without a method, we have a very difficult time teaching thinking. And I think that's fundamentally why we don't teach thinking alongside the content, because we don't have a method for doing so. And if you give teachers a method for doing so, then 
they'll use it. The goal here is to find a method, and my research over the last 20 years has been to find a method for teaching thinking um, and structuring information. You can imagine that this blob contains all the, every plant and animal that's ever existed, let's say, as an example. So imagine every plant and every animal that's ever been alive, that's alive today or that will ever be alive in the future. And what scientists try to do is sort of look across those living things, in this case, for patterns that, that lead to how they diversify or how they, you know, how, what makes them alive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what we find across all this diversity, this incredible diversity of plants and animals is, is, is the DNA, the genetic code, A, T, C, and G, these four things that combine in very dynamic ways, very simple things, they combine in very dynamic ways to create literally a nearly infinite array of diversity. So things like the platypus and the zebra stripes and the, you know, red-bellied woodpecker and whatever you can imagine is created from very simple things being combined in lots of different ways. And so now I want you to imagine that this blob contains all of human knowledge, every idea that's ever been had and every idea that's being had right now and every idea that's going to be had. And what we found is that they contain, they're all structured in four fundamental ways. D, S, R, and P, and I'll tell you what those are in a second. 